and briefly I'm just going to give you a, um, an outline of the, uh, the paper that I'm going to give today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the collection of um, archaeological artefacts as part of 20th century um, sexology. For time's sake, I'm just going to focus on one case study, which is the collection of Alfred Kinsey in the mid-20th century. Um, this is new research for me, so um, I don't yet have sort of very good uh, collecting stories about where Kinsey got his material. That's good for another, maybe that's for next year. Um, uh, but so what I'm going to focus on today is the why. I'm going to offer some in initial ideas on why I think Kinsey was interested in archaeological material as part of his sexological work. Um, I'm going to look at the way that he framed this material as part of his scientific study of sex. Um, and I'm going to compare his treatment with um, the 19th century so-called secret museums um, and their treatment of this kind of material. So just to give you a brief uh, overview on hi the history of sexual science or sexology, now thought to, or traditionally has been thought of the mainly Western attempt to understand sex scientifically that emerged in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. It's usually perceived as a field that came out of psychiatry and medicine. However, um, recent research is looking at the way in which sexologists um, wanted to understand <laughs> sex not only as a... Um, from a biological and psychological perspective, but also as a, for, in its cultural and social dimensions. Um, and this is suggesting that sexologists were, in, were interacting with the fields of historical studies, anthropology, literature, art, and also, as I'm looking at, archaeology. So it's well known that Sigmund Freud, for example, had a big collection of um, antiquities. I don't have time to go through the other collectors that I'm looking at in the, in the earlier part of the 19th century. I'm sorry to skip over this slide, but I found that many sex researchers and sex, um, um, sex institutions, um, such as um, Magnus Hirschfeld's institution in Berlin, were setting up their own um, collection of archaeological artifacts. So, but today I'm going to focus on um, Alfred Kinsey as my case study. As I'm sure you know, Kinsey was a um, a zoologist turned sexologist working in the 1940s and 50s mainly on his sexological work um, and he's very he's famous for conducting interviews with Americans with contemporary Americans about their sex lives um, in the 1940s and 50s however um, Kinsey actually had a really broad um, understanding of sexual science he, he says in his um, sex, Sexual Behaviour in the Human Male, which is the first so-called Kinsey report, that um, sex should be studied across fields in, in order to be able to understand human sexuality. And this includes archaeology. So he says, from the dawn of human history, from the drawings left by primitive peoples, on through the development of civilizations, ancient, classic, etc., um, men have left a record of their sexual activities and thinking about sex and all of this give evidence of what people think and do sexually. So he's interested in the past and he's interested in the, in the material and visual culture of the, of the past. Um, so Kinsey uh, and his um, institute for sex research built up a huge collection, actually, of material relating to sex from across time and place. Um, so as well as they, ha they, they built up an archive and library of sex research materials, they also put together this, um, these ob this object collection, um, which has now become um, what the Kinsey, I mean, the Kinsey is still running, Kinsey Institute, they've claimed to be the largest repository of sex-related materials in the world. Um, and Kinsey himself employed an, uh, an anthropologist um, who, who also had some experience in, in archaeology, um, Paul Gebhard, to come and work with him at the Institute. And together they, they set up this big um, network um, of, uh, of collectors, of museum curators, to help them to study and collect this material. As I say, I'm not giving that history today, but that's for another time. But one significant person um, is... Uh, uh, Raphael Lyco Hoyle, who was um, a Peruvian archaeologist who um, Kinsey started a collaboration with, and they were, they were going to publish a, um, a study on the um, ancient mocha uh, uh, civilization's uh, sex pots or, or erotic pots, and you can see Kinsey there in Lima visiting um, the collection there. Um, so when we, th when we think about... Um, archaeological um, 
erotica and collecting, uh, particularly museological or institutional collections of um, sexually related ancient artifacts. What our mind quite often goes to the so-called secret museums of um, of the 19th century. Um, and the most famous example, of course, is the Naples um, Archaeological Museum's Gabinetto Segreto, which from at least the, eight, the, la the um, late 18th century to, to a varying degree was um, uh, uh, segregating material from the, um, uh, the, the sites of uh, ancient Pompeii and Herculaneum because of their sexual content. Um, and housing them in a, in a special collection or later room. And the British Museum um, also had its own equivalent from at least the 1830s called the Secretum, and that brought objects from across um, museum departments or objects that would have gone to different museum departments and brought them into one room um, because of their sexual content. And these rooms were um, more or less had uh, restricted access to them. And because of these sort of secret this history of the secret museums, we often associate the modern treatment of sexual artifacts with ideas about segregation, censorship, um, and particularly the anxieties of Victorians coming face to face with the supposed um, more uh, sexual openness of the part of past cultures. Um, and indeed, scholars have linked, for example, um, the, the, the invention itself of the modern category of the pornographic or the obscene with directly with these new museum policies of segregating archaeological artifacts because of their sexual content in the 19th century. I suggest that the, the later sexological collections such as Kinsey's prevent us with a different type of engagement with this material. So um, what, instead of this idea of the material coming in and being hit, quickly hidden away, um, we find these institutions that are deliberately going out and searching, engaging with these, um, with these objects. Um, and the types of material that we find in the secret museums in the 19th century, in the 20th century sexological um, institutes, um, we find the same kinds of um, material, but in this case they're very sort of self-consciously framed as scientific kind of they're very consciously trying to move away and distance themselves from this idea of, porn, of pornography. Um, for example, in the Kinsey Institute in the 1940s, they had been buying erotica, importing erotica from around the world, and this eventually clashed with the increasingly strict US federal obscenity laws. This was during the time of McCarthyism. And so Kinsey and his staff had to really carefully articulate how this vast array of sex objects could be justified as scientific. So they wrote in this statement, they are indispensable sources of data for any scientific study of sex. Um, I suggest, though, as further to this, I suggest that this, these sexological and um, archaeological collections also help us to evaluate the earlier 19th century model of the secret museum. So this is about sort of challenging this neat progression of 19th century censorship through to 20th century um, liberation. And so scholars have, have rightly um, lamented the damaging effect that removing sexual material from their individual museum departments, such as at the British Museum, and putting them into this one collection because of their sexual content, um, and this damaging effect that this had on our modern understanding of the role of sexuality within individual cultures, that is absolutely true. However, um, as archaeologist Richard Parkinson has also recently acknowledged, the secret museum model in the 19th century, what it also did was brought together these sexually related artifacts, creating a repository of research materials for people interested in the history of sex. And this, I suggest, should be seen as contributing to the development of a specialised study of sexuality which blossomed in the second half of the 19th century and which gave birth to um, sexology, and as I've said, an interest in archaeological objects persisted within sexology in the 20th century. Um, and what the secret museums did that was really important for, um, for people studying sex and what became important for the sexologists was to provide the means to see and compare material relating to sex across cultures. This was really important. So sexologists, starting in the late 19th century, they were really keen on this cultural comparative method um, looking to other cultures in order to put 
Western practices and beliefs into sharper definition, but also to critique what they perceived, perceived, perceived as restrictive Western attitudes to sexuality as part of the sexologist's um, very progressive, often very progressive political aims. So, for example, throughout the Kinsey reports, we find alongside his tables of statistics, um, we find these references to art and, uh, and, and ancient art and artifacts from across cultures. So um, he uses these objects um, that show acts um, outside of the Western Christian mores um, to challenge the idea that these acts are, are unnatural or abnormal. So, for example, in his discussion of sexual positions, um, we see here, this is from his second book, The um, Sexual Behaviour in, in the Human Female, we see a table here that shows the frequency of different sexual positions among American heterosexual married couples in the 1940s and 1950s. And the table suggests it's that the most frequent position being used is the one in which the male is above. That's how he describes it. Um, but Kinsey says in the report, most people will be surprised to learn that positions in intercourse are as much a product of human cultures as languages and, cult and clothing. So this is supported by reference to art and, um, and artifacts from across, for example, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, Peru, India, China, Greece, and Rome, as well as evidence from so-called primitive cultures and also from the animal world. Um, so he suggests, Kinsey suggests by using this, that the, um, when, he, when we do a study of erotic art, we find that the one in which the female above um, is the most common position found in the, in the, in the ancient world, as well as in the um, modern so-called primitive world and the animal world. Um, so this, he says, proves that the missionary position um, is not normal or natural, as it might seem to most co contemporary Americans, but only common. Now, I, I'm not an expert on the, a lot of these cultures that I've just mentioned that he... Um, uh, that he references, but I do know that in ancient Greek uh, 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 visual culture, the one, the position in which the woman is on top is not the most common, definitely. And I, I mean, you might be able to tell me for the other cultures as well. So Kinsey's got it wrong there, for sure. And it, and it, and it should be said, there is some really quite jarring differences between Kinsey's really hard statistics about the intricacies of contemporary American life and his much less sophisticated analysis of ancient materials. So, for example, he distinguishes between the sex sexual practices of different American cities, but then he makes these huge sweeping statements about world history. And, you know, this is a very, his approach is a very colonial, um, cultural evolutionary approach, interest in, you know, with um, ideas about primitivism and civilization, and this, igno which ignores the specificities of particular past cultures. And in fact, as Alice um, has uh, told us earlier today in a previous talk, this material culture object based approach to the past was, um, was old fashioned by the time that Kinsey's doing this work. Um, Kinsey's really led by this desire to see ancient material as almost photographic evidence of the past. So he says, he, he says of the mocha pots, they were, um, he believes they were a sober presentation of reality, you know, ignoring any kind of ritualistic um, meanings, for example. Um, Kinsey, he, he did... Um, uh, he did ignore, um, sorry, he did acknowledge um, that the art and artifact collections were... Um, supplementary to his main project of doing the interviews. That was his main interest. And yet, just um, to sum up and conclude, I think it's still really important to recognise that archaeological material was important to this sexological um, uh, collect to this sexological institute. So, um, collecting archaeological material was seen as a fundamental part of the business of doing sexology and running a scientific um, institute. Um, this, I suggest, shows um, the intersection between archaeology and other fields, um, such as sexology, and encourages <coughs> us to think about the meanings of science, for example, um, but also the boundaries of scholarship and disciplines. Um, 
I've suggested that Kinsey's model for collecting material for his scientific institute in some ways was a descendant of this secret museum model. So bringing together artifacts relating to sex sexuality from across world cultures into one location, this very museological 19th century approach, plays a really important role for the sexologist in understanding modern Western sexual life. And this, I suggest, um, maybe hints at a new angle for the history of the modern reception of, of sexually themed archaeological artifacts, perhaps beyond just the story of censorship and pornography. Thank you.